are. All right, we're live and ready to go. All right, thank y'all so much for being here with us tonight. I thank the two brave souls that got out on this rainy night to come be with me so I wouldn't have to be here alone in our sanctuary. But anyway, let's go back to Romans chapter 5, and we'll pick up with verse 6. Again, we're going to get several verses into this. This chapter 5 is so intense, so I want to take my time with it. So as we go to Romans chapter 5, verse 6, let's also now open up with a word of prayer. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for this evening. We thank you for the gift of rain. It is always something that our earth, our world needs. We need it. But as always, it is a wonderful, beautiful reminder of how your love is always falling down upon us, always touching our lives and blessing us in so many different ways. And I just ask you now through this power of your spirit to also now anoint us, anoint us in a great and mighty way so that we can once again receive your message, your message for us tonight as once again we continue to dive into your living, life-giving work. We ask all this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. Amen. All right, now, we were just kind of talking about this some. And uh, from last week, when we looked at verses 3, 4, and 5, Paul was still continuing his message about the results of those gifts of justification. But we talked about how he takes a different point of view by telling us, be, you know, boast, rejoice in your suffering. And especially last week after we turned off the camera, the folks that were here, we were talking about, once again, you know, to boast, rejoice in your sufferings. It, it is a terrible thing to say, especially concerning the suffering that goes in our world. Because sufferings go from the loss of a job to, you know, the loss of a loved one. And it was even brought up, what do you say to the family that's lost their home living under a bridge or that mother praying to find milk, to get milk to to feed her baby, and the list can get even worse. But what if Paul wasn't really talking about boasting or rejoicing in our sufferings? Remember, it's all about recognizing God, still seeing God at work in your life. And what he talks us to is about the causes to that you go from your suffering to endurance or perseverance to produce character, which in turn gives hope. What if Paul was talking about us taking our sufferings and learning from them. And not just recognizing where God is still at work in our lives, but then taking the hope that God has given to us and once again taking his hope out into the world, helping people that are suffering. Because remember, we ended up talking about how we are called to give hope to a world that cannot give itself hope. They cannot receive hope. So anyway, it was kind of, we finished talking about all that. But now let us pick up with verse 6. And join me there looking at verses 6 and 7 and 8. For there, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us and that while we were we still were sinners, Christ died for us. All right, so now we got to realize something that up to this point, as Paul has been talking to us about a number of different things, going all the way back to chapter 1 about how the gospel of Christ is the power of God and pointing out to those choices of sin that God gave the people over to, beginning with chapter 1, verse 18, all the way to chapter 2, verse 11. And then all the way even through chapter 3, he talks about the works of righteousness through faith. And now, up to where we are now, we have been sharing about the results or the blessings, the works of justification. But the question we have to ask ourselves is this, that if telling us all about these things, what is the one thing that Paul has specific, specifically left out of his writing so far? There's one specific thing he hasn't mentioned at all. You see, up to this point, Paul has not written about the way. The way in which God has accomplished or provided all these works and these blessings that are now in our lives. Because you see, up to this point, 
Paul has still not pointed out what two specific things that make the results or the works of blessings of righteousness and justification possible in our lives. So what do you think they are? One of the two things he has not written anything, pointed out about concerning Jesus. What's the two things he has not told us yet about his what and his what? There's two things he has not mentioned up to this point in, in Romans. You see, not at one point he has mentioned his death on the cross or his resurrection from the grave. Think about it. Go back and reread this. He talks about the gospel of Christ, but he has not talked about his death or resurrection. The two specific moments that makes all of this possible. So it's in this section that we're starting now, beginning with verse 6. Paul's beginning to share with us what we can call the first part. The first part that made all this possible for you and for me, for all of us. And that is, first, the death of Christ on the cross. And here Paul is now pointing out four specific things that occurred because and through the death of Jesus. Now, I know that some of you have the New Revised Standard like I have. I know Jack's got the uh, New King James Version. I'm not sure which version Mr. Harold has. If that's New Revised or NIV that he's got. But the thing is this. As you look at this, different versions have this in a different order. Okay? They have a different order, especially between the New Revised Standard and the NIV, the New International Version. They're both different. And I'm going to find out where the King James stands on this too. But you see, in verse 6, now in my new revised standard, it starts out with Paul pointing out how we are weak. Or if you've got the NIV, it says powerless. Okay? While the NIV begins by pointing out about the timing in which all of this Occurred. So the, NRV, the, NRV, the New Revised Standard starts with week. The NIV starts with the timing, okay? Now, which one does the King James Version start with? What is it? It opens up with verse 6. For when we were yet without strength in due time, okay. Christ died for the ungodly. All right, so see, first off, it starts then with without strength. It starts with the weakness like the New Revised Standard does, okay? Well, the thing is this. With your permission, then, I want to, I'd like to go with the order given to us then in the new Revised Standard Version, since this is the version I'm using. So we're going to call it Teacher's Prerogative or Teacher's Privilege, okay? We're going to use my order here. So let's look at this. Look at this from the new Revised Standard Version. Okay, verse 6. First off, in the new Revised Standard, we are told that Christ died while we were what? While we were Still weak, weak. While, we were, while we were weakened or not strong, okay? Notice that in the New Revised it says, for while we were still weak. Or in NIV, the word powerless. Now, the question becomes this. What do you think, what do you think Paul means when he tells us that Christ died while we were still weak or powerless? What do you think he means by that saying, while, while we were still weak, we were still powerless? What does Paul mean? Is, what would that be a reference to? Because we're still lost in our what? Self. In ourselves, or another way of that is our what? Our sins. We're still lost in our sins, okay? We're weak because of that. Thing is, if we were powerless to do what concerning our sins? First off, we were powerless to stop. Not only the works of sin in our lives, okay? But also, we were also powerless to stop what? To stop what result of sin? What's the ultimate result of sin? Death. Death. So we couldn't stop the work. We were so weak, we couldn't stop the works of sin. We couldn't stop the result of sin, which was death, okay? So we were weak. But there's something else concerning this fact. And all of this came about because we were weak or powerless. You see, look at it also like this. Paul is also speaking against this teaching. There was a teaching of a belief, 
shared by a lot of people in the church back at this time, that the gift or the work of salvation is given to us as a reward. It's given to us as a reward due to some divine response on our part, our divine work on our part that earned us the right to then receive this gift of salvation, okay? But what Paul wants us to understand is that's not true. That is not the way it goes, okay? He wants us to understand this, that while we were weak, powerless, unable to do anything to help ourselves, that is, that is what, that when God did what? God took the first step for us, okay? Not because of you know, anything we had done. God made the choice to take that first step for us. Then it was God who made the choice to do for us while we, what we could not do for ourselves because we were still weak. We were powerless lives, okay? So that's what it means when we talk about that we're weak. Not that we've done anything to deserve it. God did it for us. But now look at the second one then in verse 6. Now according to the New Revised Standard, we are told that all this then occurred when? That for a while we were weak or powerless, it occurs when? What did y'all say? At the what? At the right time. Okay, at the right time. What does the... King James said. In due time. Probably. In due time. That's closer to the Greek. The Greek actually reads in due time, or you translate it that way. But I like the NIV point, okay? What it points out here, it says at just the right time, okay? Now, the question, there's once again, now there's a question that comes up concerning this statement at just the right time. Does this mean that Jesus came at just the right time because this was the time when we were at our weakest, that we were at our most powerless, okay? Now, even though for some this is the reason, they'll tell you, well, this was our, we were at our worst, weakest moment, all right? But for Paul, he says that's not it. This is not the reason as far as Paul's concerned talks to say at just the right time. You see, to help us understand what Paul means when he tells us that Christ came at just the right time, what you got to do is this. There are two Greek words for time. We need to look at them. Now, the first Greek word for time is the word chronos. Okay, it's chronos. Now, chronos refers to clock time or the amount, the, um, the measure of time. Chronos is about that specific time, specific moment that can be marked on your calendar or on your watch, okay? Now, the second Greek word for time is kairos. There's chronos, and then there is kairos. Kairos is about the quality or the value of time itself. The distinction can be understood like this. It's the difference between having a good time at a party, which is kairos, or running a good time in a race, which is chronos, okay? A good time at a party that's valuable, quality time, that is kairos. Chronos is what you mark on the calendar or you keep time to see what your time is in the race that you just ran. Now, which word do you think Paul uses in the Greek? as he's writing this. Would he use the word chronos for the measure of time or kairos for the quality of time? Which word, if you had to take guess on which one of those two, which one would you think Paul uses? In quality the of time. Huh? Quality of time. The quality, kairos. The quality time. That's the word that Paul uses. So what Paul wants us to understand is that he's not talking about a specific moment He's not referring to a date on a calendar that marks the moment that, first off, that Jesus came into our world and then died on a cross for us, okay? We're not talking about specific moments like December 25th, which is not actually Jesus' real birthday. That's the day we mark on the calendar to celebrate, to celebrate the fact that he was born and came into this world. We really don't know what the actual date is. But it's still about the quality of it, 
the quality that the Son of God came into this world, okay? And the thing is why Easter is always, it's not always on the same day and, and everything, but that's a whole other statement, okay? But Paul wants us to say it's not a specific moment or anything like that. Instead, Paul wants us to understand that God's timing is based more on kairos, that quality or the value of time. This is that it is on a specific moment of time marked on a calendar. It's not. It's not chronos. Now, Dr. Bentz, who you has written the commentary I'm using the most, he said this about it. As humans, we stare at our watches, we mark our calendars, and we wonder, why doesn't God meet our schedule? Why doesn't God keep the same schedule I, I keep? More often than not, God is waiting for just the right time in your life. You see, what we have to always understand, God's time is not what? Our time. Our time. See, sometimes we want to say, well, God's time is my time. Or my time is God's time. But it's not. God's time is not our time. And most of the time, God reveals, him at, reveals himself to us at a time when we least what? Expect. You know, you, you get God at the moment you least expect it. I'll always remember, I never will forget about this moment that happened in my life. It was years ago. Something specific happened in my life. And I had a chance to do something, but I didn't do it. I did not respond in the way I wanted to respond. God shut my mouth. He wouldn't let me speak. For four or five years, I would ask God, every now and then I think about that moment, I'd ask God, God, why didn't you let me say what I wanted to say? I could have blown those people out of the water. They had hurt me, and I wanted to hurt them back, and God wouldn't let me. And I'll never forget one morning, I was standing there, and I was shaving. And I thought about it. And I asked him, God, why, I still, why didn't you let me say something? And I'll never forget, it was at this one moment, in the morning, from the mirror shaving. Sam, it wouldn't have made a difference if you'd have said anything or not. That time, it was his timing, and that was all I needed to hear. I was completely satisfied at that moment. So the thing is, his time is not our time. And this is the point Paul's trying to make. Christ did not come at the time that he did to offer his life at the moment that he did, because we had done something to show how righteous or deserving we were. And Christ did not die at the time he did because it was marked on God's calendar. This is the day. You know, it wasn't marked on our calendars. It wasn't marked on the church calendar. It wasn't on God's calendar. This is the day it all happens. And most importantly, it didn't happen at that moment because God heard our cries for help lost in our weaknesses, okay, or powerless moments. Christ came into this world at the right moment of time that only God knew about. Okay? That's God's moment of time. God's moment of time in which he, which only he knew that it was the time in which his plan of salvation and eternal life could be accomplished. And no matter what, the question will always remain the same. Why this time? And the answer is what? Only God knows why it was at that time. All we can know for sure is what? That it was the right time for you and me. It was God's time. That's when Christ came. That's when he went to the cross. That's when he was raised from the dead. Not our time. Not on the calendar. It was all God's time. God, Because that tells us what? It was God's plan and not ours. See, that's the bottom line. I kind of went the long way around to get to that final point. You know, to know it's God's time tells us it's not our plan, it's God's plan. And that's what it's all about. But now look at the last part of verse 6. All right, third, now this is in the same order as the e Revised Standard, the NIV, and they agree with this, and I imagine the, the, King, the King James will, because it reads, for while we were still weak or powerless, at the right time, or just the right time, it then says, Christ died for the Ungodly. Is that what the King James has? Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, for the ungodly. Now, get this. 
Do you realize that this is only the second time so far in his letter to Romans that Paul has used the word ungodly? Only the second time. Now, would you like to take a guess as to what chapter that we've already studied in which Paul uses that word ungodly for the very first time? We work our way slowly and carefully, but it's in the first verse of one of the sections back that we've already covered. You want to take a guess as to what, what part of what we've already studied in Romans that it would occur in? We've got to go all the way back to chapter 1 and look at verse 18. You see, it was all the way back to chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul described what? That what will happen to the ungodly who make the choice for sin or to the choice to allow sin to control their lives. And when they made that choice, okay, fine. Then it says, you know, God gave them over. We talk about all those things, okay? You see, Paul once again uses the word ungodly because he wants us to understand the extent now of God's what? He wants us to understand the full extent of God's what for you and me. What's the next step? Salvation. Six, huh? Salvation. Well, salvation, but it comes through God's what for you and me? Love. Love. See, this opens up the door to the full extent of God's love. Now, we talk about this because when it, when it came to God's love, especially back in this time, okay, First off, what group of people did everybody believe that God would give to or pour his love on? The Jews. The Jews. So, you know, it's always believed, as we do today, that God would pour out his love on the Jewish people, his chosen people. Now, by this time in the church, it's all the way also beginning to be understood at this point that God would also have his love, it can now be extended to what second group of people? You've got the Jews, now you've got the what? Gentiles. The Gentiles, okay? That God was now beginning to give his love to all the Gentiles, or we might call them what now? Who are we? Christians. You know, the Gentiles are to the Christian church who were seeking now to follow, to be obedient to God through their faith in Christ. There were some, you know, that were following and saying, well, God also loves the Gentiles and the Christians who seek to be good, <laughs> okay? But what group of people would be the last group of people that anyone expected God to give his love to? <clears throat> the Romans. I'm, okay, not just the Romans, but put them into, that's a good guess. I like that. That fits perfectly to that. But there's another group. What did we just say? That Christ died for who? Ungodly. Ungodly. Another way to say that is these are the what of the world? Sinners. The sinners. You see, they did not believe, they expected that God could ever give his love to the sinners of this world. Especially those sinners that Paul describes, like I said, starting back in chapter 1, verse 18. Okay? You see, what Paul wants us to know is that the main concern of God's love is for those who have, who are what? Sinners. Sinners. God's main concern of love is for those who are lost in their sins. He has concern even for those sinners who worship and serve created things instead of the creator himself. He has love and concern for those who have committed those indecent acts of lust, to the degrading passion of their bodies where they now went to same-sex relationships. Even those who chose to no longer acknowledge God or to have no knowledge of God, and they become eventually filled with every kind of wickedness. You see, it was to the sinners of this world that Christ came to. He came to reach out to them. That's why Mark chapter 2 is so important. If you go and read Mark chapter 2, what you see are the so-called righteous Pharisees, okay? They see Jesus keeping company with who? The tax collectors. Tax collectors, the prostitutes, uh, the, you know, the non, you know, everybody, non jews everybody, okay, are basically the sinners. And they're like, why are you keeping company with them? Who do you think you are? 
to keep company with such sinful people. And if you remember, Jesus looks at him and he says this, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call the unrighteous, the unrighteous or call sinners. You know, that's why Jesus came. If we were already righteous and holy people, sinless people, he wouldn't have had to come. Jesus came to call sinners. But it ain't going to stop there. You see, also when Paul writes that Christ died for the ungodly, he's also telling us another great truth. That not only did Christ die for those who were lost in their choice to allow sin into their lives, he's telling us that Christ also died for who? Who else did Christ die for? For all of us. Not just those who have deliberately made that choice, but even sinners like me. Who I don't, you know, I don't get up deliberately in the morning thinking, you know, I'm going to holler at the first guy that pulls out in front of me in my automobile. You know, I don't get up thinking, planning stuff like that. Things that just happen. Okay? But I'm still a sinner. I'm still caught up in that sometimes. So it wasn't just those who on purpose, but also for all of us. He came. And that shows us what? The extent then of his love. Of all his love for you and for me. And then the thing is so, as we then move into verse 7, that's when we began this, we can discover then the fourth part. Remember I said there were four things with this about his death on the cross. Now to help us understand this, Paul comes across to us as if he's getting off track or off subject. Now, notice what he says, okay, there in verse 7. And, you know, he talks, talks about, first off, verse 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Then some people say, what is he talking about? Because they'll say he got off track. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But he didn't get off track. Once again, you know, Paul starts his fourth part, part out by pointing out who someone might be willing to die for. Now, did you notice the way Paul does this? He makes a point by pointing out what? He points out two what? Two separate groups of people. He points out who would, somebody might die for a righteous person, but others may dare to die for a what? an unrighteous or a good person. He makes the point, he points two separate groups out. Now, he first points out that rare occurrence, someone to be willing to die for, like he says, will anyone die for a righteous person? All right? Now, the question is this. What does Paul mean by a righteous person? Then? What do you think, a right, who, who is a righteous person or what makes a person righteous? really hard to tell. That is hard to tell. It's a hard thing to, to, to think about. But maybe, what, maybe it's like this. You see, a righteous person, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they're always described back in the time of Jesus as being not just a holy person, but a what kind of person? Righteous. A righteous person. They were seen as righteous because they always kept what? They always kept the what? Clean thoughts. And well, clean, but faith. put it all together. They kept, they kept God's what? Faith. Promise. Promise are his laws. He always, they always kept God's laws. They did it in a moral, blameless, upright way. Okay? These were, in that, like I said, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they did this. And for the Jewish people, they were considered, you know, holy of holiest men according to their religious beliefs. And so Paul is saying, you know, remember Jesus always saying, don't pay attention to them. Don't act like them. Don't be like them. Be holy. Be, you know, don't, don't display your righteousness. Don't do something out in the open like they were always doing. But back in that time, to a Jewish person, these were still the holy people. And some of them would have been willing to die for that righteous person. But then Paul moves beyond being willing to die for a righteous person, it points out that others might be willing to die then for what other kind of person? 
unrighteous. An unrighteous. What is your a good man. A good man, unrighteous. The New Revised says, just says this, a good person might someone dare to die. All right, so now we've got the other question. What's the next question? What does Paul mean by a good person? So what, did, what makes a person good? Free from sin. Free from sin? Okay. Well, I mean, that's going to be tough because we're not all doing <laughs> How many of us are actually free from our sin? But you're, right, but you're going in the right direction. What do you think makes somebody a good person? Good intentions. Good intentions. Oh, I like that. Okay, good intentions. Uh, <laughs> God said the smallest deed is worth more than the greatest of it. That's true. Okay. And remember, Jesus always said, don't go doing things so other people will see. Only do it so your heavenly father is the you and him are the only ones that know about it. Okay? But what about if we look at it like this? When it comes to a good person, is this a good person is someone who's willing to look beyond the faults, the failures, or the mistakes of others? And help them because they realize that they have the same one. They're willing to look beyond somebody's faults, failures, and mistakes and still help them because they know they have the same one. Problems. So they have the exact same faults, mistakes, and failures in their own life. But they're still willing to help. They're still what? They're trying to be good. To do what is right. And what is right? You know, to love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's a good, you know, that's right. That's trying to be a good person. But do you think a, a, a good deed cancels a sin? No, I think only the blood of Christ can cancel a sin. sin. But I think there's nothing wrong with trying to do good deeds, but that's what we should want to do after we confess our sins and have the blood of Christ remove that sin. So, but the thing is, you know, Basically, what's this really about, okay? But because he talks about a righteous person. He talks about a good person. You know, as I said, Paul's not getting off track or trying to change the subject that some people have come to believe. No, instead, what, what is Paul really telling us about Jesus? You see, he's not really pointing out to, you know, to, he points out to a group of people, but in doing this, he's actually telling us something about Jesus. He's showing us how Jesus is different from all the rest of us because he's willing to do what? Take your sins. Take your sins, and he's willing to do that by doing what? To die. Because he's willing to die not just for a righteous person, not just for a good person, but Jesus was also willing to die for who? All of you. All of us. For you and me. So, man, yeah, I mean, we can, we can have a wonderful conversation about what is a righteous person versus a good person. But I think what Paul, you know, what matters to Paul is this. To us to understand it's all about Jesus. If Jesus did it for both of them, while at the same time, he did it for us all. So why don't we stop here? I was hoping to get into verse 8. But we'll stop here. We'll pick up with verse 8 next week and continue on into this. And then we're going to get into the contrast and comparison between Adam and Jesus. Okay? When we get to verse 12. So thank you so much for being here with me tonight. All of those who are here with me, those that are watching us at home, you'll be watching us live right now. Or maybe you're catching us later this week. Whatever it is, we're glad you're a part of our time together in this study. Come back and join us next week, and until then, take care, and God bless, and goodbye.